thank you very much for coming this evening. And uh, I trust everyone does have a set of notes. And we're going to be looking at Lesson 2 this evening, The Church in the Acts. And I'd like to read a verse or two with you by way of introduction in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. And verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. And then we have a little later in the section the commandment, the great commission, as he revealed to them that they would receive power in verse 8 once the Holy Spirit had come upon them, and they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then he went back to heaven, and they waited for 50 days, that is, until Pentecost. In verse 1 of chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, this was 50 days after the death of the Lord Jesus. Uh, 50 days uh, following the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, in the Jewish calendar in the springtime. And we read that when it was fully come, they all with one accord were in one place. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with other tongues, other languages. And uh, there was a great multitude in Jerusalem who were visiting for the festival of Pentecost, of weeks as it's called, and they were from all over the Roman Empire. And they heard about this, and they came to hear what was happening. And uh, we read that they heard in their own language. And uh, they were just so surprised at this because they said, we know that these gentlemen who are speaking are Galileans. They should have a hillbilly twang. Uh, and uh, we're, we're hearing in the language uh, where it, wherein we were born. And uh, Peter then stands up. They, there's an accusation made in verse 13 of chapter 2. These men are full of new wine. It's a bit early in the day to be drunk, isn't it? Let's remember that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel had rejected God the Father. And so he said, well, I know what to do. I'll send my son. And the Lord Jesus came. And they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. And they crucified him. And so God said, well, I know what to do with them. I'll open heaven and send my Holy Spirit. That's what I'll do. And he sent his Holy Spirit upon this company in Jerusalem. And the response was, these men are drunk. And they rejected the witness of the Spirit. <clears throat> but we read that uh, that wasn't the case with all of them. Uh, as the story continues, Peter, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, <coughs> began to preach and uh, tying together the Old Testament prophecies, uh, he calls uh, Moses and David, two of the best witnesses you could have in front of a group of Jews. He calls them uh, forward and they testify uh, to the resurrection and uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. And we come to verse uh, 40, with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all, as everyone had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. I don't suppose it comes as a shock to a group like this that none of the great days of history are found in the history books. The creation is not treated as a historical event, or the fall, or the flood, the Tower of Babel, the call of Abraham, the incarnation, or the transfiguration. The crucifixion may get a footnote somewhere in Roman history. 
certainly not the resurrection and certainly not the birth of the church. These are not treated as historical events. And the reason is that all of the great days of history are the days when God broke into time and did something. And on this occasion, what an amazing thing he did. We're going to think about that in just a minute, but uh, let me point out to you that probably at the top of your page it will read the Acts of the Apostles. And as you have probably had it pointed out to you, it isn't so much the Acts of the Apostles. We read a little bit about Peter and a little about Paul, but we don't hear anything about the other apostles to speak of at all. It's actually the ongoing Acts. You notice what uh, Luke tells us that he wrote a previous book, which we call it the Gospel by Luke, and he said in that previous book, Theophilus, I told you of the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. You'll notice the order there, you do before you teach. You set the example before you tell people the reason. And so the Lord Jesus did this. He practiced it. He lived the life for 30 years before he ever opened his mouth publicly. And he, he did, and he taught, and then he went back to heaven. But before he went back to heaven, that night in the upper room, he made a very shocking statement. He said to the disciples, you're impressed with my works, are you? Greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. The secret, of course, was that the greater works they were going to do were actually the works he was going to do through them. The Lord working with them. You'll notice the statement, the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. The Lord worked with them. And so the Lord Jesus was saying, I'm going away, but I'm leaving my body on earth. You are the body of Christ. You're his hands, you're his eyes, you're his mouth, and you are going to live out the life of Christ. It will be Christ in you. And Paul could say, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so the ongoing works, these miraculous, these wonderful works, and we'll think about that a little later in the study, were actually a manifestation of the ongoing life of Christ in the lives of his people. And so we might retitle the book, The Ongoing Acts of the Lord Jesus by His Spirit through His People. Now the other thing we notice about the book of Acts is that when we come to the end, it doesn't end. It just kind of dribbles away. We don't find out what happened to Peter, what happened to Paul. It sounds as if it's a work in progress. Well, it is, isn't it? because it's still being written. You're writing a chapter, I'm writing a chapter. Every true believer, every child of God has a part to play in this wonderful story and the story hasn't finished yet. And someday, when God has finished his story, that is finished history, which is his story, and he brings us home, he's going to unroll the canvas and he's going to tell us what he really did through his people. That's why the scripture says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Because he's going to reveal what he was able to do. Do you think those gospel tracts you've handed out, the seeds that have been scattered, you have no idea what's happened to them. But he keeps track of every one, you know. He's a good farmer. And he keeps track of every one. And someday we'll find out. Once in a while we do get a little clue here and there. I, I visited with an elderly gentleman from Switzerland who lives in Quebec City. Jean-Paul Bernet is his name, and uh, he told me a story that uh, 50 years, more than 50 years ago, he visited a little island in the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, called Saint-Pierre, a French possession, and he visited every house with gospel tracts. Nothing came of it. Came back to Quebec, 50 years went by, he got a phone call one day. Uh, Mr. Bernet, yes. Uh, did you come to St. Pierre and give out little papers about Jesus? <laughs> well, 50 years ago I did. Yes, well, my father, he got one of them. And um, he died recently, and we picked up, uh, we were cleaning out the boxes, and we found this little paper, and I read it, and my heart said yes. And I showed it to my wife, and her heart said yes, and my daughter and my son-in-law and our neighbors, would you come and teach us the Bible? 50 years later, 
The only reason the connection was made was because he had a little stamp on the back of the, of the gospel track. But all the work that goes out, the prayers that are prayed, do you think they just go out into the air? God keeps track. If God keeps track of every tear and every hair on your head, then you can be sure he keeps track of every gospel tract, every word of testimony, every prayer you have ever prayed. God has record of it all. And he's going to show us someday what he's done with it. You know what he says? Jesus himself said that when you sow seed, some of it hits hard ground and nothing comes of it, but some of it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. 100 fold is 10,000% return on your investment. Was Jesus exaggerating? I think he's done a fair bit better job than we think he has. And we're going to find out someday because the Bible says that John saw the people who just were saved during the tribulation. And they were a great company that no one could number out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So this book of Acts begins, just, just sort of points the way. And as we go back, I'd like, if we could, to transport ourselves back to those early days. Jesus has died. And the disciples were devastated. But a few days later, word came to them from some trembling women. He's alive. He's alive, and they couldn't believe it. They, it was too much to hope for. But one by one, Jesus appeared to them, and their hearts leapt within them. He was alive. But only ten days later, he took them out to the top of Olivet, and after blessing them and commissioning them, he went up, says the Bible, and he was gone. And two angels said, well, gentlemen, it's no time to stand around. Uh, Jesus is coming back. But there are things to be done. And they went into the city of Jerusalem, remembering his word, and they worshipped, and they prayed, and they fellowshiped together, and they waited. Waited for what? I'm going back to heaven, he said, and I'm going to pray the Father, and the Father will send the Spirit to you. And so it was, the Spirit of God came. Now, this was going to be the key. There wasn't anything they could do unless the Spirit of God came. Do you know, Christian, every prayer you have ever prayed, it was the Spirit who inspired you and took those stumbling words and translated them into a God-sized prayer. Every comfort you've ever received, every ray of light on the sacred scriptures, every revelation of truth, everything you've ever benefited from in the exercise of gift in the church, you owe it to the Holy Spirit of God. Every conviction of sin to bring you back to the path. Every act of restoration. It's the Holy Spirit of God, wasn't it? Oh, how much we owe to him. He's the one who unifies us, who makes us one. And this is the beauty of it. The Apostle Paul said, by one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Now, as we look at this chapter, I've laid out for you about a dozen characteristics of the early church. And it's good for all of us, it will be tough homework, but it's good for all of us as we go point by point to ask ourselves the question, am I a New Testament Christian? Is this how I live? Is this what people would think of if they looked at my life? And what about our local church? Is it like this? Using the word of God to examine where we stand in the light of the word of God. <coughs> so the first characteristic we discover is found in chapter 1 when the Lord Jesus gave the commission. Now the disciples said to him, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were looking back and hoping for the restoration of a movement. Does that sound familiar? Looking back to the golden days, the, the, the good old days when when Wonderful things were happening, and we, we have this tendency to look back and say, if only it could be like the good old days. And what we want is the restoration of a movement. Of a, it was a definite work of God. I was in Wales, and they're talking about the 1904 Welsh Revival. It's coming up 100 years. And I said, brethren, I love church history, but I'll tell you, I'm praying for the 2004 Welsh Revival. That's what we need to see. We need to see God at work now. And so they were looking back and they were hoping for the restoration of a movement. But Jesus was looking ahead. 
He wasn't thinking about the old days. He was saying, gentlemen, look ahead. Look at the potential. Look at the opportunities here. He wasn't thinking small. He was thinking big. They were thinking about little Israel, 60 miles by 150. And Jesus said, no, go into all the world and preach the gospel. They were thinking defensively. And how often I hear Christians, you know, if you can just hang on till the Lord comes, just keep this little church going until the Lord comes. And the Lord says, no, 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 I want you to be in the advance mode. I want you to be on the offensive. Last night we read those words. Jesus said, uh, the gates shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Well, you know, hell isn't running around with the gates attacking the church. That's not the picture. The picture is of the church storming the ramparts of the enemy and breaking through and rescuing people who have been held in bondage by the devil. That's the picture. And that's what Jesus called the early church to do. Not to hang together, not to just form a little little clump there in Jerusalem. You know what they did? They did form a little clump, didn't they? And what happened was the Lord had to allow trouble to come in, persecution to drive them out. And what did they do? They went everywhere preaching the gospel. But you will notice that that these disciples bought into the vision of the Lord Jesus. They said, that's it. That's right, isn't it? And so Paul could write to the Romans, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And furthermore, he said, the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. What a tremendous thing. The second thing we notice is that they waited on the Spirit. They waited on the Spirit until Pentecost. And we notice the phrase there in verse 1 of chapter 2, until Pentecost was fully come. And I've listed out for you here uh, five things that happened at Pentecost. First of all, it was a reversal of Babel. Let's go back in our minds to Genesis chapter 11. Shinar means the country with two rivers, the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, the grand Shinar plain. And as the human race at that point lived as a community, as they moved eastward, they came to this magnificent plain. God had said to them in chapter 9, after the flood, Be fruitful and multiply and cover the earth. And they said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We want to stick together. And so they said, this is an ideal spot. Let's build us a tower that will reach up to heaven. I don't think they thought they were going to reach heaven, but a tower that had to do with the worship of the heavens. Let us make us a name. They called the name of their condominium project Bab-El, which means the gate to God. And God came down and squeezed the words together and called it Babel, which means confusion. And he, the scripture says, God came down to look at the city and the tower which they built. And God said, we need to do something here. If we let them carry on, there isn't anything they won't do. And so God confounded their languages. And they couldn't understand each other. And so they had to separate. They had to move out. That, that first collective insurrection against God, defiance of the word of God, became the seed from which grew a great system, a system which we see featured in the book of Daniel. And it comes to its end in the book of the Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, a religious, political, and economic system called Babylon the Great. It's not so much a, a geographical thing, it is It is the pervasive, official rebellion of the world against the government of God. In fact, the Bible is the tale of two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon is the place where men said, let us make us a name. And Jerusalem is the place where God has put his name. And we notice throughout these early chapters, the name of the Lord Jesus. They preached in the name. They suffered for the name. They baptized in the name. They healed in the name. And that was the issue. The Jews, the Sanhedrin said to them, stop doing it in that name. Didn't we tell you not to do it in that name? Oh, said Peter, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Instead of lifting up 
their own names. Let's make us a name. What happened at Pentecost was that the disciples, they said, we want his name. Now, Babel was described in this way. They used brick for stone and they used slime for mortar. That's man's artificial uh, compromise, his counterfeit for the true work of God. This was the beginning of the construction. Living stones put together and living stones with the mortar, if you will, of the Holy Spirit of God linking us together. And so it was a reversal of Babel that day when everyone heard in his own language. God confounded the languages at Babel, but then here we read that everyone was confounded when they heard in their own language. And God was saying, now listen, they wanted to build a name, build a tower for themselves. I'm going to build something. This is the beginning of my building, and it's going to be the place where my name is, and I'm not going to use cheap counterfeit material. This is going to be the real stuff. Precious stones put into this temple, and, and the name of the Lord is going to be prominent. And I'm going to preach the gospel in every language. I'm going out with this message to the whole world. It was a judgment on the Jews, on the nation of Israel. They thought God only spoke Hebrew. He was their own private God. God said, no, I'm going out to the whole world. So it was a reversal of Babel. Secondly, it was a reversal of Sinai. Paul makes this quite clear, doesn't he? That there was the giving of the law at Sinai. There was the giving of the grace of God at Pentecost. The one is called, you have it in your notes, um, the ministration of death written and engraven in stone. Whereas this is called the ministration of the spirit. Now we read at Sinai where the law was given about 3,000 were slain. And at the giving of the gospel of the grace of God at Pentecost there were about 3,000 saved. The law could only condemn, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful thing. You know what happened here? This was a mass resurrection. 3,000 who were dead in their sins were risen to life right before their eyes. Christian, I hope you never get over it. The joy of seeing someone born again coming to life before your very eyes. It was a reversal of Sinai. And then it was a complete fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. Let's remember that this was God's blueprint for history. Passover was the death of Christ. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And then linked with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the holy life of those who have found safety in the blood. And then there was the Feast of First Fruits, when they took the new sheaf and cut it down, laid it in the darkness for three days, and then brought it out on the first day of the week, the first fruits of them that slept, our Lord Jesus Christ, waved before God the beginning of the harvest. Then they counted 50 days. 50 days, which meant that both the day of resurrection, okay, the, it was the day after the Sabbath that the sheaf was weighed before the Lord. The Lord Jesus rose again on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. And so the first day of the week was Resurrection Day. And then they counted seven Sabbaths plus one, and that brought them back again to the first day of the week. The only two Jewish festivals held on the first day of the week, one which pictured the Resurrection Day of Christ and the other which pictures the resurrection day of the church, the birth of the church. The church brought to life through this glorious coming of the Holy Spirit of God. And so it was a fulfillment of this. And I have a little chart for you there. We don't have time to look at it, but Pentecost in the Old Testament, Pentecost in the New Testament, two loaves leavened. Now we know that leaven is a picture of sin. When we have the Passover bread, that's a picture of the physical body of Christ. No leaven in that. But when we come to Pentecost bread, it's a picture of the mystical body of Christ. It's us. And unfortunately, there's leaven in this body. 
But you'll notice that the action of the leaven has been arrested by the fire. We who have been judged in the cross have discovered the secret of victory, not only the penalty of sin dealt with, but the secret of the power of sin. And so while we are not sinless, we ought to sin less. We have found the secret of victory to sin. And so, yes, there's leaven in these loaves, but it has been arrested. Its action has been arrested by the fire. Well, we don't have more time for that. I hurry on. But it's the idea of two made one, two wave loaves united by the pouring of the holy oil upon it. And so we have Jew and Gentile, as Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, two are made one by the Holy Spirit of God. And then, number four, there was a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. If we had time to go back and read the story in Joel 2, it's a description of the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of great tribulation, and how the Lord is going to come in in judgment, but that at the conclusion of that period, God is going to send his Holy Spirit and the Jews are going to speak with other tongues. Now, that was partially fulfilled at Pentecost. Remember, they were all Jews at Pentecost. This is no, no justification for the charismatic movement. Uh, it, it was, they were all Jews. The Jews required a sign. Tongue speaking was a sign to the Jews. And it was given there at Pentecost. It was only a partial fulfillment of Joel too. Peter says this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. But if you go back and read it, the full manifestation will wait until the book of the Revelation. And when you go over to Revelation, you can read what happens there when the moon is turned to blood, the sun turns dark, the sackcloth, and so on. That's all part of Joel's prophecy. That did not happen at Pentecost. It was only a partial fulfillment because there was only a partial turning of the Jews to God. And then we have the birthday of the church. Um, I, I quoted the verse already, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Notice the two sides to it. By one spirit were we all baptized into one body. What happens in baptism? You go into the water. But he goes on to say, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now what happens when you drink? Well, the water goes into you, doesn't it? And so here we have this beautiful picture that we have been put into the Spirit, immersed in the Spirit, but we also have received the Spirit. So we're in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in us. Like a shell in the ocean, the ocean is in the shell. Not all of the ocean is in the shell, but all that is in the shell is ocean. The ocean is in the shell, the shell is in the ocean. And so I have been brought into this wonderful relationship where the Spirit of God personally has come into me. And I have all that resource within me. But also, I have been baptized into the Spirit. And it's in this wonderful unity that the church has been provided and the power, the inner power, that we go forth to accomplish the great commission which he's given us. Otherwise, we just couldn't do it. I have, again, another little chart there on the Spirit in the Old Testament, the Spirit in the New Testament. We're going to have to hurry on. The third characteristic of the early church, you'll see C, uh, three quarters of the way down page six, they constantly gave witness to Christ in the proclamation of the gospel. We are not all evangelists, but we are all to be witnesses. We'll talk about that a little bit further, but uh, let me just tell you a quick story. I have no time for it, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, I was in Cardiff uh, in last September and the Christians are pretty discouraged. The mine shut down, a lot of the people left, a lot of the churches are small and struggling. Uh, but you know, there's a lady there, she's about 95, she spent 75 years as a missionary in Trinidad and Tobago, and she's been used by the Lord in a most marvelous way to reach out to the Muslim community in Cardiff. She sits and writes letters to, she goes through the phone book, finds all the Muslim sounding names in her neighborhood, and then she writes a letter, and she says, uh, welcome to our neighborhood. You can imagine how many welcome letters these people receive. Welcome to our neighborhood. We're so glad that you've moved into the, into the area here. Uh, I'm an old lady, and I pray for all the children in the neighborhood. And if you'd like to send me your children's names, I'd like to pray for them every day. 
And if you'd like a Bible, I found the Bible very helpful. I'm 95 years old now, and and in, in all of the hard times of my life, I found the Bible has been the biggest help to me of anything I have. And if you'd like a copy of the Bible, I'd like to send you one and a little book on how to study the Bible. She said, I had five more responses last week. (laughs) She can't even hardly get out. She hauls herself around on two canes. But there she is, faint yet pursuing, believing with all her heart that God has not left us here just to uh, smell the daisies. He's left us here to accomplish a work for him. It's a great work, and we need to be involved in it. I find a great deal of negative attitudes among the people of God, like, well, you know, this is the day of small things. Well, I, pa- I quote that passage to you here in, in, the, in the chapter. The day of small things is out of the book of Zechariah. And it's describing not small results, but small resources. Because it describes how many people are going to be saved during the tribulation period. It's a great company that no one can number. So don't use that verse to excuse lack of blessing, brothers and sisters. That's totally out of context. This is not a day of small things. This is a day of great things. You read the early church. The Lord Jesus said, greater works than I have done will you do. Well, that's what we ought to be doing. That's what we ought to be seeing. Don't settle for mediocrity. Cry out to God, why are we not seeing the blessing we should be seeing? What is the secret? I think we're going to find some of the answers if I ever get on to the rest of the chapter here. All right. Uh, Number four, they prove the unifying influence of the Spirit by cooperating and working together. Notice the phrase, with one accord. We read it several times. It's many times throughout this book. They were together. They were together. Where there's unity, there's blessing. I visit many local churches where I find out that this sister's not talking to that one or this brother's not to, and sometimes it's because of what somebody's grandfather did. Brothers and sisters, we can't afford that. We have got to get the thing fixed. The Lord Jesus died so we could be one. The Spirit of God came so we could be one. And we need to be one if we expect God to use us in accomplishing his work. We can't afford these silly little things to stay in the way and rob us of our effectiveness in the work of God. How can we expect unbelievers to believe that they can be reconciled to holy God if we can't be reconciled to each other? We need to manifest what grace is. The grace of God. It's not just for the unbelievers to get saved. It's for the believers to get along with each other. He gives more grace. Grace upon grace. Unsearchable riches of his grace. There's more than enough grace to get along. And we'll think about that a little later too. Well then they practice certain things. Baptism, the apostles doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. These are what you might call the four basic food groups of a a healthy diet. There are other meetings of the church. We read about those. Uh, They met for, the elders met. They met for church discipline, for gospel efforts, for missionary reports. But these were the four basic food groups of the early church. And if every local church makes arrangements for these things, we ought to be there. We need, if you don't eat your veggies, you get sick. You know, that's why your mother told you to eat up your peas. Because we need a balanced diet. And so God has provided this balanced diet. And what are the characteristics of these four key events in the week of the church? Well, truth, truth, the apostles' doctrine, the regular, faithful, accurate teaching of the word of God. That ought to be happening. And I've got a whole chapter in the back, an appendix, with a list of all the basic doctrines of the Bible so that I think in every local church, there should be one elder who's tracking the ministry, who knows that we haven't taught this, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit or or gifts or whatever it might be for about five years now. It's way too long. Every five years, we should be covering every doctrine in the Bible, the whole counsel of God. That's about the time from a a 13-year-old until they go off to school or get a job. That's how much time we have to get them through God's Bible school. Now, if you don't teach a doctrine, the devil will. The church suffers a heresy for every truth that we fail to teach. We've got to teach it, and we've got to teach it properly. That was number one, truth. Number two, love. The fellowship of saints. They loved each other. Does that sound radical? (laughs) They did. Why? They were in each other's homes all the time. 
They cared for each other. You need something, brother? I'll sell my real estate and give you the money. People say, oh, you know, that's pretty radical stuff. Yeah, it is. Christianity is radical stuff. It's so radical that the communists are flummoxed by it. I've seen Christianity at work in some of these countries, and I've seen brethren who have given away the front door to their house to a widow to keep the cold out. That's the real stuff, isn't it? And that's what marked these early Christians. And we can say, well, that was just for long ago and far away, but it's not. It's for now. The fact is we don't even know what the needs of God's people are because we're not in each other's homes. We just meet each other on Sunday. The Bible does not say exhorting one another weekly. It says exhorting one another daily. And if we're going to encourage one another daily, we've got to be in each other's lives. We've got beautiful homes. We've had, we have better homes today than we've ever had. Bigger homes with microwaves and freezers. And we have these automobiles, which are air-conditioned living rooms, portable living rooms. My father used to say Solomon in all his glory was not conveyed in one of these. And we get in our cars and we can ride. We don't have to hook up the horses. We don't have to fight the elements. And yet we have all kinds of excuses. We say, well, it's so far away. We live so far away. How far do you go to a shopping mall? There's no excuse for it. We need to be in each other's homes. The hospitality of saints is absolutely essential. This word hospitality means lovers of strangers. And you know, a lot of times we're strangers to each other, aren't we? We need to show a kindness to one another. You'll see here six important reasons under number six why we ought to love the brotherhood. Not because they're lovable. No fellowship based on people will ever work. We don't... We don't the basis of our relationship with one another is not because we're all such wonderful people. We're a bunch of poor sinners. It's a wonder we ever get along. The only secret is we love what he loves. That's what the Lord said to Peter. Peter, do you love me? Not do you love my sheep. Sheep are stinky and wayward and they wander off and cause you heartaches. But if you love me, you'll love what I love. That's the secret. If I love him, I'll love his people because he loves them. And I'll care for them for his sake. So there are six reasons there. Again, we don't have time to look at them. I'm not going to give you a remedial reading course tonight. You can read them on your own. Number seven, they took seriously the leading of the Spirit. Oh, brothers and sisters, do you get the feeling sometimes that we're going around banging our head against the wall? Work here, try this, a little gospel effort there, and we see so little for our, for our work. Can you imagine if a, if a fisherman went out, he went fishing out in the lake, and he caught a fish. And then a month later, he caught two fish. And then three or four weeks later, he caught another fish. He'd be pretty happy if he was a sport fisherman. But if he was a commercial fisherman, well, he'd be out of business, wouldn't he? We treat evangelism like sport fishing. Catch one fish and talk about it for three months. It was this big, you know? <laughs> That's not the gospel. I mean, if a, a farmer says to his wife, I'm going out to do a little seeding in the field. Oh, good. He's back in 15 minutes. How did, you're back already? What happened? Oh, I threw one there and a couple over there and, you know. <laughs> no, farmers don't do that. They broadcast it. They cover the field with seed, don't they? But Christians, I think that we've missed this idea of aligning ourselves under the Spirit of God. There's a dear brother out in western Canada. His name is named Steve Kember. He saw a tremendous work of God done among some Hutterites out in Alberta. About 130 Hutterites got saved. A, a community of people who taught work salvation, and, and God gave him an open door, and they were gloriously saved. Well, he lives in southern Manitoba now. A man came to him one day and said, My brother-in-law wants to hear the message you preach. Will you take it to him? All right. He gave him his address. It was in a little town called La Crete, up on the Yukon border, 1,200 miles away. I don't know how many of us would do this, but Steve Kember went down to his travel agent and bought a plane ticket and flew from Winnipeg all the way up to Slave Lake and then rented a car and drove 200 miles up to this little town of La Crete, found the address, knocked at the door and said, I'm Steve Kember, I understand you want to hear the gospel. The man said, give me 15 minutes. And he ran out the door, came back 15 minutes later, huffing and puffing, and said, okay, we're ready. And he took him down to a storefront 
where 150 people were sitting waiting to hear the gospel. That sounds like Acts to me, doesn't it? What is it? Steve said, well, Jabe, I just wait for the Lord to open a door and I go through it. That's what we need. I have set before thee an open door, Revelation 3.8. A great door and effectual. The word effectual means energized. There's power in it. Is opened unto me, 2 Corinthians 1.6. I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. A door of faith was opened to the Gentiles. They prayed that God would open a door of utterance, the word. Utterance means the word. A door where the word gets in. Christians, go ahead. There's a brick wall. Go bang your head against it. Doesn't sound like a good idea to me. I think what we need is to wait on God till he opens a door. That's what the early disciples did, you see, to get down before God. And that's what praying and fasting is. There's nothing magical about fasting. Praying and fasting means hold lunch. God hasn't answered yet. Hold tea, he hasn't answered yet. Hold supper, he hasn't answered yet. It's praying through until we get a clear direction from God as to where the door is in the wall. And when God opens a door and you step through it and, and God begins to do a great work, see, we, we are so suspect of blessing that any time there's a great work, we think, oh, I don't know about that. They probably aren't really saved. Is that what you would have said about the book of Acts? Well, it may be that there's carelessness in the way the gospel is preached, but, but we ought to be seeing blessing. Nothing has changed since the book of Acts, ladies and gentlemen. We still have the Great Commission. The Lord Jesus did not say, Lo, I am with you all way, even to the end of the age, except for the last few years. The Spirit of God is still here. The Word of God is still the power of God unto salvation. Do you think that your society, your culture, is tougher than Rome or Corinth or Athens? Do you think so? The gospel can do it. But we need to know where the doors are. And in order to know where the doors are, we have to align ourselves under the Holy Spirit of God. Instead of getting on the preaching circuit and making plans five years in advance, how about just waiting on God and saying, oh God, show us. We, we don't want to live like this. We, we don't want to get used to being unblessed, for making excuses. Lord, open heaven. Open a door to us. Give us boldness, give us courage, give us confidence, show us how to do this. Because we're just kidding ourselves if we think we're New Testament churches and nothing is happening. Because when you open the book of Acts, man, it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. And we say, oh God, we want it to happen in our lives. I mean, when I was in, in England in September, they were showing me where C.H. McIntosh was buried and where Billy Bray preached and where John Wesley was, and all, well, I, that's all fun. But I say, well, where did the people get saved lately? <laughs> that's what we want to see. I don't want to just hear about it. Like David, I say, oh God, show me your power. Show me your glory. I don't want to just hear about it. I want to see it. I want to see God work. And I believe God can work, and I don't think there's one limitation to it, except perhaps not the unbelief of the unbelievers, it's the unbelief of the Christians. Oh, well, sorry, it's over with Ireland. It's over with Europe. You know, they had their chance. I don't find that in the Bible. I find that God is willing. He's not willing that any should perish and, and that he, he's holding back his judgment so that more people might get saved. That's what marked the early church. They were serious about the leading of the Holy Spirit. They were known for good works. Oh, here's another reason. The Apostle Paul, as he writes to the saints, he links their fruitfulness with their good works. He says, you be careful to main good, maintain good works that you be not fruitful. The danger is, he says, that if you stop doing good works, you stop bearing fruit. Are we known for our good works? If I knocked on the doors of the neighbors of your local church, would, is that what they'd say? Oh, they're good people. They're, they're doing good works in the community all the time. You see, a whole group of Christians have been disenfranchised. There are many Christians who would be terrified to go to the door with a gospel tract, who'd love to go to the door with a casserole. We need those kind of people. Like Tabitha, Dorcas, 
She softened up the, the coastal region around Sharon by her good works so that when Peter came to town, people were ready to listen. Are, is, are you with her? Are you with Tabitha? Well, yeah, he was. He just raised her from the dead. And, and by making that link, they opened their hearts. You see, good works makes the gospel winsome. When people come to hear the gospel and we tell them you're sinners on the way to hell, that's kind of hard to take, you know. Unless, of course, these people that are telling you that are the people that have just helped you through your sickness and done all sorts of good works in the community. Listen to the verses. It's not once or twice. Folks, we have missed this. We've missed this whole line. When was the last time you heard a preacher get up and tell the folks, we need to be doing more good works? Listen to what Paul says. Well, first of all, the ministry of the Lord Jesus. He went about doing good. You realize how much of his ministry was going about doing good. And then we read, these things I will, that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. That they may see your good works, said the Lord Jesus, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Look at the verse at the bottom of the page. Our Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and... Purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works, eager to do it, looking for it. I go to some places to to have gospel efforts, and you know, half the people are brought out by one woman. She has a large family. She has uh, eight kids. She ha- they have three or four cars, but she has, they have to rent a large van to bring the rest of the people. They can't get them into their own cars. Because every time there's somebody sick in the neighborhood, they're there with a casserole. One of their daughters cleans the house. One of their sons cuts the grass. So when gospel time comes and they call up, they owe them. The Bible says, owe no man anything but to love one another. And when I love you, you owe me. I don't have to say it. You know it. If we're going to be winsome in the gospel, then we have to be workers of good, doing good works. Largely, the women were the workforce of the early church. They were doing good in the communities, and that's what we need to get back to. If we're going to be effective in the gospel, we have got to begin practicing regularly being zealous of good works. We've left it up to the government to do it. The government can't do it, and we need to be doing it. And if we want to be effective, we need to take this seriously. At the top of page 8, I mentioned about widows over the age of 60 who have during their married lives been known for doing good works. They should be financially supported by the local church to do good works in the community. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. You can read it in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Have you ever seen that practiced? They are are a blue chip stock. They should not be going back and eking out with a part-time job somewhere trying to pay the bills. We should should see these people as a golden resource and encouraging them to be doing good works in our community and winning friends of the world with the mammon of unrighteousness. Using our money to win friends for the gospel. That's what we ought to be doing. And then, number nine, they fulfilled the Lord's promise that he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, you know the works Jesus did when he was here. Are you doing greater works than that? If you're not, then you're not doing what he intended. Well, what does that mean? Well, they'd seen what he'd done, but these were greater works. I was sitting in the plane one day. I started to witness to the lady beside me, and she said, oh, I'm a Christian. I said, you are. Wonderful. Um, What will we talk about? She said, did you hear about that man who was raised from the dead in Africa? I said, which one? Oh, there's more than one. I said, I've heard of millions. Millions? (laughs) Oh, sure. I said, you don't mean that fellow, bonky fellow that raised somebody physically from the dead. That's no kindness. You've got to die twice then. I mean, dying once is enough, isn't it? That's no benefit. This is the point, you see, that people settle for lesser works. It's no, it's no great thing to physically heal someone, but for people to be spiritually healed. Oh, now that's really something, isn't it? F- to be physically brought back from the dead, well, yeah, I suppose, if, if that's the sort of thing you like. But to be raised from the dead spiritually, to live forever, now that's something. That's what Jesus meant. He fed He fed 5,000 people with physical bread. They fed 5,000 people with spiritual bread. They saw 5,000 people saved in one day. Spiritual bread. Now that's, that's a greater work, isn't it? 
greater numerically, greater geographically, greater ethnically, and greater in, their, in the spirituality, in the, in the value, in the purpose of the miracle. It wasn't a temporary thing. You get bread for a day, what good is that? But to have everlasting life, to have bread that gives you life forever, now that's a great work. So they were known as people who, who did greater works. And, and I've got some references here for you. Um, great power, great grace, great fear, great joy, and yes, great persecution. It was no day of small things. It was a great day. And God help us to start praying great prayers again. We pray such little prayers. Pray for Aunt Maud Sarteau. When, when the Apostle Paul prays like this, I pray that you might be fruitful in every good work. Could you pray that prayer? Not just, oh Lord, give them a little encouragement. It'd be nice if you saw one or two souls saved. To pray big prayers. He prays so much that he actually says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That you might be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. That you might uh, be able to endure with all joyfulness. I mean, these are big prayers. And we need to pray like that again for the people of God. They kept their lives simple by clinging to Christ. They preached Christ, they lived Christ, and they didn't get distracted. I'm afraid for you, lest you be beguiled from the simplicity that's in Christ. Oh, to do a little homework, to spread out our lives at the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, you pick through it. What would you like me to do? Is this how you'd like me to live? To test it all by what the Lord Jesus thinks. You see, people say, uh, is what you're living for worth dying for? That's not the question. Is what you're living for worth Christ dying for? That's the question. And that's what the Christians said. They said, we reckon that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all. That they who live should not henceforth live to themselves, but live to him. In other words, everything I do, every penny I spend, every minute I spend, I want to ask Jesus, what do you think of that? Was that worth dying for? Okay, then that's how I want to live. It's a simple test, isn't it? But it's the secret of victory and power in the life. They lived in the moment-by-moment -moment anticipation of the coming again of the Lord Jesus. Well, time's all gone. What does it mean to be a New Testament assembly? Last night, someone asked about the church in the wilderness, mentioned in Acts 7.38. Well, the word church is a, is a general word. It's simply the word for assembly, a gathering of people. It's used of the mob at Ephesus. They were an assembly. And sometimes our assemblies look like that, but that's not the idea. An assembly simply means a, a bunch of people together with a common purpose. And so that word is, has to be qualified. The church of Christ, the church which is his body, uh, the local church. In other words, it, it's not simply a bunch of people. It's a bunch of people with a common purpose. They're together for a reason. And so the question is, what is a New Testament assembly? It's easy enough to take the claim, but the question is, are we New Testament assemblies, and is that the best way to meet? Now, Israel was designed for people who all lived within 150 miles. The Jewish religion was designed for people who were all within a few days' walk of Jerusalem. And so God would say, I want you to bring a lamb, I want you to come three times a year, and so on. That would not work today. If we had to drop ship lambs into the middle of the Amazon to, to believers there and, and take charter flights to Jerusalem... So the church was designed in a very different way to the way is the Jewish religion was designed. You know what, you know what people did? They, they borrowed from Judaism and they brought it into Christianity. So if you visit many churches today, you'll find a selective priesthood, vestments, robes, incense. They don't have a, a, a veil, they have a rail, but it's the same idea. We stay on this side, you stay on that side. That's Judaism, that's not Christianity. Christianity got rid of all that so that the church is transferable to every culture. I have broken bread with believers in Japan and behind the bamboo curtain in China. I've, I've sat down and broke bread with a little group in a, a leprosarium in the Bahamas. I've been all, in all these different countries of the world, different languages. They didn't have any of the stuff that Western churches have. A lot of times we were out under the, under the sky, uh, breaking bread, remembering the Lord. All you had to have was bread. It doesn't even say what kind of bread. Manioc bread, I've had manioc bread, corn bread, sourdough bread, you name it, I've had it. 
<laughs> and so God has designed it so that it can transfer, so you can have a church in a prison camp or in an inner city or in a jungle. It, it's designed to work in every situation. These mega churches that we see, they only work in the West. You have to have huge money, big buildings, television cameras, all kinds of stuff. And the first thing that the oppressive regimes do, they take away your buildings, they take away your pastors, your Bible schools and seminaries, and all you have are little groups of Christians meeting in homes with the word of God to teach them and the spirit to guide them, which is what the Lord intended in the first place. It's workable. It's persecution proof. It's, it's designed for the rapid deployment of the gospel. You don't have to find some promising young man in the jungles of Africa to ship him back to seminary. God raises up gift right there under your nose and, and he carries on his work. And so as we think of the New Testament church, may God lay hold of our hearts, burn it into our brains. We're not trying to compare ourselves with others. Listen to these words. We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. They measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Brothers and sisters, there's no room for pride. Pride will keep us from discovering the truth of the word of God. Many Christians have assumed we know it all. And because of that, we're missing some of the key elements in this book. And we're suffering for it. We have not been teaching good works. We have not been teaching many of these things that you're hearing tonight. And we need to get back to that. We need to get to the full revelation of the word of God. We need, if you will, powers court too. And we need to get back and open up this book and say, Oh God, we have been prideful and we thought we knew it all and we don't know it all. And we want you to teach us and show us what it really means to be a New Testament assembly. And you know, the minute we do that, we can claim to be a New Testament assembly. Because it has nothing to do with our condition. It has to do with our attitude. Do we want to follow the word of God? Do we want this to be our guide? And if we do, if we test everything by the word of God, then we qualify because the New Testament is our standard. It's our guidebook. We're not presuming we do it all. We, we carry on in much weakness. But we want to follow the word of God. And we don't presume we know it all. And if that's the case, then the Lord will guide us into all truth. He'll give us vigor again. He'll give us joy in our ch local church life. He'll give us blessing. Because it won't be us. You can't have New Testament churches without New Testament life. We've got the form, perhaps, but we need the life. And the life comes not through knowing it all, but through submitting ourselves happily to the head and to the spirit and to the word and saying, we're just little children. Teach us how to do this. Show us how, Lord. We don't know how to do it. It's evident by our lives. It's evident by our local churches. We don't know how to do it. But we want to see this again. We want New Testament life. We want New Testament power. We want New Testament blessing. And I tell you, God would love to give it to us. May our hearts be emboldened to, to lay hold of God, to have faith that God wants to do it in our day, in this country, in our local churches. And if we do, don't be surprised if God does it. Shall we pray? Our Father, now we take our hearts and lay them before the throne and say, Lord, look inside and see if there are things, if there are prideful thoughts, careless thoughts, if we have assumed that we have known it all, when in reality there is a great deal we have not yet learned. And we pray, O oh God, that, that our hearts will be enlarged, that our hearts will be thrilled. We say, Lord, we want to see this. Do it again. Open heaven. Give us an open door and effectual. Teach us how to do good works. Teach us how to love people, how to communicate the truth. We think of these people in Pentecost. They spoke in the language people understood. How Hebrew was thought to be a religious language. It's what religious people used. But they didn't preach in Hebrew. They preached in the languages the people heard. And how we have this religious language we use, and the majority of people don't have a clue what we're saying. Help us to speak in their language, to communicate the truth in a way that they can understand it. Help us, Father, to love them for Jesus' sake, to love one another for Jesus' sake. And to see this happen again as it happened in Acts, oh Lord, do it again, we ask in the Savior's name. Amen.